Shenandoah National Park in Virginia is a beautiful place to behold and visit. With over 500 miles of trails to explore, breathtaking waterfalls, and the amazing three-hour skyline drive, it's hard to decide where to visit first. Who would think that in the midst of so much beauty and so many fun activities to partake in, that there could be something as ugly and evil as what happened in the late spring of 1996 at a campsite to two young women who had their whole lives ahead of them. Julianne Julie Williams, 24 years of age, from St. Cloud, Minnesota, and Laura Lolly Winans, 26 years of age, from Gross Point, Michigan, went on a camping trip with their golden retriever Taj to Shenandoah National Park in May 1996. Julie's dad, Tom Williams, said that the trip was away for his daughter, a geology major in college who studied at Carleton College in Northfield, Minnesota, to enjoy some free time before starting a new job in Lake Champlain, Vermont. Julie was a sports lover, winning the Minnesota State Double Tennis Championships in high school. She spent some time in Europe furthering her studies. She moved to Greek Macedonia and then to Italy to study the extinction of the dinosaurs. Her acquaintances from college remembered her as an amazing and smart student who was passionate about geology and couldn't wait to get out of the classroom to get into the field. Even so, when she came back home from her trip to Europe, she decided to take some time off college to figure her life out. It's hard for a young woman to find her place in the world especially at such a young age. Julie was very insecure about the light quaver in her voice, and she struggled with her sexual orientation. She had dated men her whole life, but she gradually began to accept that she was a lesbian, and she decided to move to Richmond, Vermont. It was a small city where she could feel safe to come out. Lolly was born in Gross Point, Michigan. She came from a wealthy background. In spite of her privileges, Lolly felt like a misfit and always rejected her parents' lifestyle, moving out from her family home right after graduating from high school. She enrolled in Sterling College, a private college in Craftsburg, Vermont. She loved outdoor adventures and being in the woods. She valued her friendships more than anything and had a great sense of humor. According to accounts by her close friends, she had been sexually abused by a trusted man when she was a child. This trauma led to her having problems with alcohol, which eventually led to her dropping out of college. In 1994, she began therapy and decided to put her life together. She moved to Waterville, Maine and attended Unity College. She desired to be a wilderness guide. During that time, she got engaged to a man, but they later broke up. She began an internship at Woods Women, a Minnesota-based outdoor recreation program for women. There she met Julie, the love of her life. The two instantly felt a connection and started a relationship. It was the first relationship with a woman for both of them. They moved in together in Huntington, Vermont. Life was looking up for them. In May of 1996, Julie got a job offer in Lake Champlain, Vermont. In the intermission, she and Lolly decided to go on a camping trip along the Appalachian Trail at Shenandoah National Park so they could enjoy some time together before Julie started her new job. The plan was to go back home for a friend's wedding on June 1st. The couple left for the backpacking trip with their dog Taj on May 19th, stopping at Pinnacle's Overlook on Skyline Drive. They chose a lovely, peaceful spot next to a mountain stream near the Bridal Trail, a part of the horse trail system that runs from Big Meadows to Skyland. Though much is unknown about the actual events that took place during this time, it is thought that they enjoyed a few days of hiking in the mountains before they were last seen alive on May 24th. On May 34th, May 31st, Julie's father reported she and Lolly, who was known to him only as a friend, missing. 
Park rangers began a search and found their car parked near Skyland Lodge. They searched the nearby trails and found their dog wandering around unleashed. They did not find Julie and Lolly until the next day, about half a mile from their vehicle. Their bodies were at their campsite on Bridal Trail, a part of the horse trail system that runs from Big Meadows to Skyland. Their bodies were found bound and gagged, both their throats slit. There were no signs of sexual assault. Lolly was found inside the tent. She had been bound and gagged by duct tape that had first been used to tape Julie's mouth. Unlike Julie, her ankles were bound. Both women were partially undressed. No semen was found. Julie's body, sleeping bag, and sleeping pad were 30 to 40 feet away down a little embankment. Deputy Chief Ranger at Shenador National Park, Bridget Vonet, explains that the bodies were undiscovered in such a popular part of the park on a busy holiday weekend because one of the regulations at the time was that the backpackers had to camp away from designated trails, fire roads, and developed areas. She says that it wasn't a heavily used or heavily traveled trail. They were following the backcountry regulations at the time, which required them to be out of sight. A camera was discovered at the camp with photos of their hike along the White Oak Canyon Trail. They climbed Hawksville, the highest mountain in Shenandoah, just before they pitched camp for the last time a few days after they entered the park. The park service waited 36 hours after the discovery to announce the murders, even though the park was full of visitors who may have been at risk. When the announcement was finally made, Acting Park Superintendent Greg Stiles called it an isolated incident without providing any basis for such a statement. The FBI shortly announced afterwards that the murders appeared to be random. After the murders, those who knew them best, their families, were shocked to learn that Lolly and Julie were lovers. They had no idea that the two young ladies were lesbians. The LGBT A plus community was left in shock too, and the Vermont Coalition for Lesbian and Gay Rights recognized the killings as a hate crime. Soon after the bodies were found, the FBI joined the local police department and the park rangers in the investigation. Authorities ruled out robbery as motive since nothing was taken. This wasn't the first murder that took place on the Appalachian Trail. Lolly and Julie's murders were the eighth and ninth that occurred there. One such murder was a lesbian who was shot to death by a man who saw her kiss her girlfriend. That murderer is serving a life sentence and he was in prison when Lolly and Julie were killed. The FBI did not link their murders to any other previous crimes that took place in the Appalachian Trail. The FBI did connect the murders to another double murder of a lesbian couple that took place on October 1986 in the Colonial Parkway, Virginia. The victims, Rebecca Dowski and Kathleen Thomas, were found dead in a car that had been pushed off an embankment near Williamsburg. Their throats had been slashed with a sharp object, their wrists bound, and there was no sign of struggle. Both women were fully clothed and there were no signs of sexual assault. Nothing had been taken as their wallets and purses were left in their car, so robbery was not a motive. Many couples, homosexual and heterosexual, had been killed in that same parkway, but no arrest has ever been made. A serial killer may have been responsible for the murders. Even though there have been similarities, the FBI never found actual evidence that could link the two cases. They offered a $25,000 reward for any information. Authorities confirmed that the murders could have been motivated by the sexual orientations of the victims, but they were pursuing all kinds of motives. It was hard to confirm that the murders were a hate crime. Lolly's former fiance was even interviewed by police and he was ruled out as a suspect. 
there were a few men looked at as suspects of the crime. Richard Evanitz was considered a suspect, but he committed suicide in 2002 as the police were about to arrest him and three other murder murders. It is not known if any evidence connects him to the case. Another suspect, the prime suspect, is Maryland resident Daryl David Rice. In July 1997, a Canadian tourist, Yvonne Malbasha, was riding a bike along the Shenandoah Skyline Drive when a man driving a truck forced her off her bike and tried to get her in his vehicle. He screamed sexual profanities at her. She was able to fight him off and hide behind a tree. After he realized he couldn't find her, the man drove away. Park rangers caught him as he was fleeing the park. They found hand and leg restraints in his truck. The attacker was none other than Daryl David Rice, a young man in his late 20s. He had no previous criminal records. In 1998, Rice pleaded guilty to the attempted abduction of Yvonne Malbasha and was sentenced to 135 months in prison. He became a suspect in Julian Lottie's murders sometime after his conviction. He's seen on surveillance com cameras entering the park on May 25th, the 26th, and again on June, t on June 1st. He denied being at the park on May 25th and 26th, but admitted to being there on June 1st. On April 10th, 2001, Attorney General John Ashcroft announced the indictment of Daryl David Rice and the murders of Julie and Lolly Winans. Julie Williams and Lolly Winans, based on circumstantial evidence and stated that the case would have been handled as a hate crime. It is alleged by prosecutors that after his arrest, Rice has stated on several occasions that he enjoys assaulting women because they are, in his own words, more vulnerable than men. Prosecutors also alleged that Rice said that the women deserved to die because they were gay. Rice was charged with four counts of capital murder, two of which he selected his victims because of their sexual orientation. By Rice being charged with a hate crime, his indictment invoked a federal sentencing enhancement. If convicted, he could receive the death penalty. In the end, authorities did not find forensic evidence against him. Furthermore, in 2003, a hair that did not match his or the victim's was found at the crime scene. The charges against him were dismissed in 2004 without prejudice, which means that it was still possible to charge him with the murders at a later date. A forensic test failed to rule out Richard Evanitz, the suspect who committed suicide, as the source of two key headheads found at the scene. As of today, the case is still pending. It is not a cold case. Authorities are still looking for evidence in the slayings. If you have any information concerning this case, please contact your local, local FBI office or the nearest American embassy or consulate. Certain aspects of this video is alleged. I encourage everyone to conduct their own research of this case. Thanks for watching.